there is not a single company, there is not a single industry, there is not a single organization that does not have its own jargon. Okay, so let's get started. So I went to the Wharton School, and there is a point of view, mine, that said that Wharton was really language immersion studies. While people now have a completely different point of view about why you go to business school, when I went to business school, I will tell you that my entire agenda was to get a job that was going to be of greater interest to me and more career-oriented than anything that I could do as a psych major with a bachelor's degree from in a liberal arts school. I wanted an interesting life. And because of my background and my point of view, I thought, well, this is cool. I'll go to MBA school. Very few women were there. We were in the class that was the first class that was more than 5% female. But my point of view was that it was language immersion studies. So I was just learning all kinds of interesting stuff that I would never have an opportunity to learn otherwise. And from Warden, I went to the Ford Motor Company. And the first thing they said to me at Ford was, you know that fancy language that you have? Don't use it. I was working with car dealers. I was working with car salesmen. I was dealing with the field operations at the Ford Motor Company. Not only did they say, don't use that language, they then spent an entire year teaching me the language of the automobile industry, which is its own thing. We have 10 days. They take count every 10 days. I had to learn all the models. I had to understand that they didn't care about market share. They cared about percent of Chevy. That was our measurement. All right, I needed to understand that Hondas were considered pregnant roller skates. So when my boss talked about a pregnant roller skate, he was not talking about something this big, he was actually talking about a car. From Ford, I went over to the phone company, and it was during a period of time prior to uh, what we refer to as divestiture, where the phone company was not yet a competitive company. I was hired in anticipation of competition, but it wasn't there yet. And I had come from a very competitive business. And the first week I was at the phone company, the first thing my new boss said to me was, you know, there are some words you need to get out of your vocabulary. So we don't want to hear about things called profit. Everything about the Ford Motor Company was profit. Every car was profitable. Every uh, every day was profitable, every month was profitable, every salesman was looking about profit. They were making a profit on every part that they sold. And at the phone company, they said, no, we don't call it profit. We refer to it as contribution to dial tone line. And then I spent another couple of years of my life learning about everything that the phone company and I had to learn the language of engineers and engineering. I had to learn about operations. I had to learn about construction. People don't understand that I have a lot of mm, about construction because you can't do a telephone company without having a construction company right behind you. It's all a part and one of the same. So that was Bell. But remember, I came from the liberal arts tradition. And one of the things that they learned about me was I was working at the phone company was I really liked special projects that I was really good at. Go investigate something, go figure out what is going on. And because I had all these different vocabularies at my fingertips, I had the Wharton vocabulary, I had a mindset from the Ford, I had learned a lot about the phone company, they would send me off to go and learn something new, go figure out what's going on, and then come back and, and tell us what you've learned so I could communicate. 
And what I realized is that my favorite part of being in business, my favorite part of being a consultant, was that I was doing something that I learned about in my psych courses, which was I was jumping up onto the learning curve. Do you guys know about the learning curve? Yeah. It's good stuff, all right? At the beginning, you work at it, you work at it, you work at it, you can't figure it out. It's really, really hard. And then, oh my God, at one point, you start realizing that you know something new. You're learning something new. I used to figure out that if I could get five words, if I could finally get just five, whatever they were talking about, whatever issue they were trying to tell me about, there were parts where it, there weren't making any sense. And then all of a sudden, a word would become nuanced. And I would realize that the word divestiture wasn't really just about two companies separating. It was about an entire era and all of the things that were going around it. And so I would start, once I got those five words under my belt, then I could really start to ask better questions start translating between one group and another and begin to truly understand. And then at the top, I would just go, yeah, I got it. I'm a happy camper. But one of the things I realized is that every industry, every company, every project has its own lingo. It's true everywhere. Every, um, every company that you work in, Every way of life, every neighborhood that you're in has its own language. And I realized that sometimes the fun part for me when I would do consulting projects is I would frequently say, I'm the only multilingual person in the room. And then someone would say, well, do you speak French? Eh, high school, maybe a little college. Do you speak Russian? No. Spanish? Mm -mm. Well then, why are you saying you're multilingual? I speak accounting. I speak regulatory. I speak finance. I speak marketing and sales. They're two different languages. I speak operations. I can speak construction. I understand the difference between the network operations and the network engineering and um, other kinds up here, field operations. I, I had all of these different languages so that my best and most fun projects would be those where I would be listening to the different groups of people on a project team kind of talking past each other. Mm -hmm. And I would be in the room and there was marketing and operations and finance and engineering. And a lot of the times my job was to make sure that operations installed, what engineering designed, that marketing sold by the date due. And every now and then you would hear somebody from marketing say, well, they needed to do, uh, oh, I don't know, we want customer service to be, you know, answer the phone within three rings. And the finance guy would roll his eyes. Because what that marketing person just requested was something that would double the price of the entire project. But the marketing guy didn't know that. Okay, I'm gonna pick on marketing. I'm a marketing person. Another time I would hear the marketing person say, well, we want this certain feature. We need this particular feature. And the engineers are looking at each other. They're shaking their head. And I would look at the engineer and say, what's the story? And he goes, well, that particular feature is contrary to the laws of physics. We can't do that. So sometimes I was translating back and forth just from the look on their face. There were other times when we would say to a part of the project team, we would say, well, we need these kinds of things. We need this construction work done by a certain date. And everyone's talking to each other. And finally, we just say to the construction people, talk to yourselves. And they talk, and then I would hear something that I refer to as consensus. I would hear consensus. Didn't have a clue as to what it is they were saying. I will tell you that right up front. 
But I would look at them and say, I hear consensus, what did you decide? And then they would just look at me and say, well, Joe said he'll do this, and John said he'll take care of that, and, and, uh, and Sue said she'll take care of that, so we'll be able to get this thing done on a certain date for the people who want it on that date. Okay, did I need to speak their language? Not necessarily. Did it help that I understood that they were talking to each other and that they weren't excluding me, but they were trying to get something done? Yes. So part of the issue here is that every group has its own language. And the research that I was doing because of the books that I've written and the apps that I've got, which are ExecuSpeak Dictionary, is I started learning about something that linguists refer to as a discourse community. Now generally, when you hear about a discourse community, you're usually in a group of academics. And we're all bored. And they're not talking to anybody in business. I can tell you that right away. And the other thing that I had also noticed as a business person, as a kid who went to Wharton, all right, is that I would be reading these articles in Forbes and the Wall Street Journal and it would be saying something on the order of 10 words you should never use. Or, uh, you know, business lingo is out to exclude us. And I would think about that and then they would throw out terms like paradigm shift. Or as a score counselor, my favorite was the engineer, and I said, so you think that net income and gross income are jargon? And the engineer said, yes. I said, you realize that those are really precise terms. We're not trying to confuse you. They, they have meaning, but not to them. And so I realized that part of what was going on in the world of journalists and the people who are reporting on business is they were talking about the vocabulary of business as though it was to exclude. But it's not there to exclude. So I see this article. This is one of those things that Atlantic Magazine did recently where they were saying, okay, so this group uses these buzzwords and that group uses those buzzwords. And they've actually got the, the real image goes down to here because it was like really long and narrow with a whole lot of different groups. And they were just, you know, playing around with the lingo. And I realized and I learned as I was following up on a couple of different articles that this concept of language in business being used to exclude or to define rank, or to determine who was in the in crowd, was actually foisted upon us by a group of MIT sociologists who during World War I or II or something were looking around and poking around in business. And they said, oh well, you can tell who's who and you can figure out rank by the language that they use. Oh my God. What a disservice they have done to us, even here in the 21st century. Because what it is, is each one of these groups is actually a discourse community. And the definition of a discourse community from those academics that have a two-page definition of linguists, two pages, a group of people who are working together and have a verbal shorthand because they are trying to get something done. That just sounds like a workplace. It doesn't sound like people trying to exclude and include, and it doesn't sound like rank. It sounds like a workplace. Now, what we've done over um, the course of our lives, which I've seen a lot, is we give doctors a pass. They use all that special language and we say, oh yeah, it's okay. Oh, great, doctors get a pass, all right? You want the doctor to be talking to the other doctors and the other people in the medical community in shorthand. Why should they be talking about a uh, cardio, catheterization lab. We 
need to get this sample from Mr. So-and-so to the cardiocatheterization lab and we need to do it right away. Wouldn't you rather have the doctor say, take the sample CCB stat? Yes. Well, we're all doing that. It's just that we're not doctors, so we don't get a free pass. Okay? All right. Mom and the kid, they're talking to each other. They're using their own language. Mom isn't saying, well, we had to send a sample to the cardiocatheterization lab and this happened and that happened. First of all, that's not her lingo. She's not comfortable with that. But she's trying to talk to another person about a situation. And so she'll say, remember what happened to Grandma Lily? Well, she's, it's a similar situation. Okay, the kid got it. Mom and daughter, they're a discourse community, the two of them. It's shorthand, it's abbreviated, they're getting something done. She's communicating with her child. Then we have all the people in billing or the lawyers. They have their own language. They're also trying to get something done and, and trying to communicate with us is sometimes uh, easier and not so easy. Each one of these other groups in a business environment is a discourse community. People in the library who work here, you have your own language. You talk to each other and you just say, I'm going to the cafeteria. You don't say, I'm going up to the fourth floor, I'm going this, and you just say, I'm going up. Sometimes you don't even have to say, I'm going to the cafeteria. You have abbreviations for different rooms and different places. You don't go into the full discussion. All right? If when I was at, um, let's say I'm at the phone company, uh, you know, we would, we would talk about different or organizations, acronym city. Oh my God, the number of acronyms we had. You almost, we, we actually had glossaries this thick that were floating around in the building. But everybody does it. So if you see that group of people, you can't tell by looking at them that they may be talking a completely different language than you are because they're getting something done. Maybe they're a project team. Maybe they're uh, a, a group of people who are starting up a, a new restaurant. Maybe they're a group of people starting up a, re a new business. Maybe they've been working together for 20 years in a factory. You don't know. You only find out that they know each other really well and that they're getting something done because you walk in and you hear them talking and you're pretty sure it's English, but you haven't got a clue. The same thing goes on with the group at the airport that's trying to get a project done. The same thing's going on with, what you, where, are they classmates? Maybe, do you know what subject they're studying? Not until you go in and find out, you're not sure exactly what they're talking about. So here's how we learn language. Children are listening and listening and listening, and then they learn to speak. By the time this little girl picks up that marker, she is already talking. Someone is talking to her and saying, oh, did you like the green marker? Did you like the blue marker? She's saying, oh, I'm going to draw a picture of a flower, or I'm going to make an animal. And there's a conversation. Listen, listen, speak. She'll learn how to read and write later. For adults, it's not like that at all. What's going on with adults is reading and reading and reading and hoping that they can make sense of it. We've all seen this picture at work where it's just a pile of stuff and you're going through it and some of it's new, some of it's not. If you get lucky, maybe they gave you a class or a session. Maybe they gave you um, uh, some kind of sheet and say you're going to learn about this. If you have a question, you're in trouble. Now what's really interesting, at least from my perspective, is that the linguists, they've been doing all kinds of incredible work lately because computer, computing power is so amazing that they, they do things that they could never do. What they've discovered, the linguists have said, there is one universal word Every language. How many languages are there? There's a lot. 
All right, so they're talking about not only maybe the 72 or the 92 major languages, but they're talking about all the other ones that we forget about. 20, 10 people still speak it, 100 people still speak it. They went through all the languages and they found out there was one universal word. If you're talking to me and we're looking at each other one-on-one -on -one and you said something and I don't understand it, what comes out of my mouth? Huh? I don't need to define it for you. One of the things that was interesting in this article talking about the universal word is that it's short, it's sharp, it interrupts the speaker but it lets the speaker know that you don't really have a lot to say, but that you didn't understand. What do you do when you're reading? You don't have a universal word because there's no one there to talk to. So when you're reading, here's what the neuroscientists have learned. When you're reading and you come up against a word that you don't know or you've never seen before. Your brain is going to do one of two things. It's going to either not see the word at all. It doesn't exist. Someone's going to turn to you and say, didn't you see it said to get gra grab the red sweater? All right, maybe it said burgundy, maybe it said maroon, maybe it said something. And you just said, well, it just said the sweater, and there were two sweaters, and I grabbed that one. Oops. Didn't you see that? No, I didn't see it. You didn't see it. Your brain just slid right over it. Okay, the second thing is it's going to make up a meaning. Now, what I love are the academics who say, oh, well, when you come to a word you don't know, you figure out, you suss it out. Figure out what you were saying. Figure out, you know, what's the root, what's the context. Okay. All right, so number one, your brain had to recognize that it's an unknown word. You had to recognize. And then you had to realize that your brain was making up a meaning. You could be right. You could be wrong. So what I've been trying to do over the last couple of years is come up with a third way. And that's what I talk about when I say, this is, it's an app. It's a bunch of books, but it's an app. So one of the things that we didn't talk about in my bio is that I'm a part of an RCO. Now what everyone will tell me is, okay, I'll look that word up on Google. Okay, you go look that word up on Google, RCO regional, a registered community organization. The Philadelphia Zoning Code created these things out of whole cloth. They said, we want community involvement, and so we're gonna ask for there to be uh, organizations throughout the city where the communities get to put in the, what they say and have an impact and, and a voice, and we're gonna call them RCOs because they're gonna register with the city of Philadelphia that they wanna have voice. So if you go to Google, you type in RCO, and then you type in the word Philadelphia, and it's gonna come up with the right meaning. It's real fast. So you think, hey, Google's got it. All right, what's the difference between a cellar and a basement? In any place other than the city of Philadelphia, there's not much of a difference. There's some nuance. Okay, so you have wine cellars, you have Cellars, they're downstairs. Basements, they're downstairs. So let's go to Google and see what Google does for us. Basement or cellar? You go to Basement Philadelphia, you find out about waterproofing. You go to Basement Philadelphia, you're gonna find out about the basement at the Bellevue. You're gonna find out about a restaurant, you're gonna find out about a store. You're not even gonna get a definition of a basement in some place where I go down. You go to cellar, you're gonna get a whole other set of words, but none of them are going to be able to tell you that in the Philadelphia Zoning Code, a basement is 50% or more above grade, 
and a seller is 50% or more below. Because it's a legal definition and it only applies in the city of Philadelphia. Okay? The only people who are using this kind of language, L and I, lawyers, community groups, um, maybe some construction people, not very many. There was one day where I found myself in the middle of a discussion about basement versus cellar versus zoning code versus insurance. I thought my brain was going to explode because every word that was a common word had a really specific meaning. So if I wasn't concentrating on the conversation, what they were saying made no sense at all, none. But if I was concentrating on the conversation, then it was a very interesting, nuanced discussion, which makes us all nuts when we think about these kinds of things. So what I've done, and part of what I've learned, is that I think I've come up with a third way when it comes to what we need to know. How do we learn language? So this is the most important stuff. This is the keys to the kingdom, okay? It takes seven to 20 repetitions of a new word or phrase to make it your own. Anybody who says to you, oh, I just read the flashcards and I know that word, they're not human. Seven to 20 repetitions, reading, writing, speaking, listening. They refer to those, the linguists refer to those as different kinds of contexts because they're using different neural pathways. I say that if we do a lot of reading, that guy in the earlier photo who was going through the pile of stuff, I think he was frying his brain because everything was coming in through reading. And you're not going to learn that way. It doesn't work. The brain needs the information to come through all four ways and then in addition it needs different usage, different terms, different uh, tenses, different context in a different kind of context. Seven to 20 repetitions. It's that old learning curve again. Not only that, what they've learned about adults is that we need to sleep on it. So if you think you're gonna read the flashcard 20 times in one day, or write it down 20 times, or talk to different people, it's not enough. You want to start learning it, and then you want to go to sleep and wake up the next morning and do it again. So the message is that your workplace is normal and typical when it's using language and lingo that you don't understand. This seven to 20 repetitions by multiple methods of coming in and, and using it also explains why couples have their own language, families have their own language, how all of a sudden you can figure out which people are your son's friends because they're using the same language. So a new employee needs to learn this new language and then because it's around them and they're surrounded by it, then they come and they start talking to me and I have no idea what their company does or what they're doing and they've forgotten that they have learned a brand new language that I don't know. And yet even two days ago, someone said, oh yeah, well it's very exclusionary. They're not excluding you. I know you feel excluded but you're not being excluded. They're just using a language that has meaning, that has precision in their workplace. And every workplace has that situation. So that's what we've got. So here I talk about when a Google search won't help, what I've got are books and eBooks and apps. What I've shown you here is I have three. I have the Philadelphia Zoning Code. I have residential real estate, and the blue one is the original, and it's just general business. And one day someone said to me, well, how did you curate that general business? I was watching TV. So much business lingo has seeped into the language of just everything. The, 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 the cute lieutenant with the miniskirt, with her two guys behind her, 
we need to do a cost-benefit analysis before we go to the boss. Okay, that's great. Glad to know that. So what we've got is when a Google search won't help, you can use these tools in a meeting. You can use them under the table. They were designed to be used under the table. That was the idea, that you would be able to read something when no one was looking. So instead of tweeting under the table or checking Facebook under the table, you were quickly doing a quick, 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 help, help, help. Uh, oh my God, what is a deal breaker? What do they mean when they're talking about decision analysis? Because that's what we've done. We've made it that short and that sweet. I had to write the books in order to be able to get to the content. And then it's also a good memory refresh or reinforcement as you're trying to uh, uh, learn what you're doing. Now, what I realized is that no one's asked me a single question. So this is your moment. Mm -hmm. Yes? What do you think is the best way when you're in a meeting like that? It sounds like you're in this situation a lot. When you don't know what they're saying, but you do need to understand it, you might not be able to access your phone. Like, what is the best way to say that about the decision? You know, say, what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I, I will tell you that sometimes I just look up at them and say, what are you talking about? It depends upon the meaning and it depends upon who, what my role is and, and if I'm, if I'm, if. my favorite boss said to me, there is a window of opportunity presented by ignorance. Hmm. When you're the new kid on the block, when you're the new person on the job, when you're the new person in the, on the team, whatever it is you want to describe as the new person wherever, where you have, I don't know what you're talking about, kind of moment, there's a window of opportunity where you can just say, excuse me, um, can you tell me what that means? It helps when you're the new person. If you're not the new person, that's a separate issue. Okay, um, if I'm in a situation where I don't understand or I don't know what's going on, I'll sometimes just write the word down. For starters, I'm imprinting it on my brain that I don't know that word. Uh, you know, part of this whole seven to 20 repetition, which I found interesting as a marketing person, uh, the, the first seven are so essential and a lot of times you don't even know that you're getting the first seven. From a marketing perspective, you need to touch somebody three times before they may even know they've been touched. From a sales perspective, you need to call or contact somebody, reach out, okay? Because that means phone or email or text or talk or whatever, but seven times if you want them to realize they've been contacted. It's the same thing. It's the learning curve. It's the ability for your brain to recognize a new word or phrase that's been coming through and your name may be that new word or phrase. Uh, I'm, I've gone to the point where I will interrupt. Just say, excuse me. Sometimes I just do a hum. That helps. Uh, it, it, a lot of times it's just a question of having the, the courage. When I don't have the courage, I write it down. I'll go figure it out later. Yeah. So that you can walk into a different language almost every day, four or five times a day, from somebody walking into a county office, getting your taxes done, to somebody coming to your house, working on your furnace, to a whole bunch of things. Oh, yeah. You just have to say a lot of times, you can break that down in layman's terms, so I can Can say. you explain it to me? Yes. I mean, that happens all the time. It happens all the time. So unless you, so you have to get into that situation five, seven times before you actually start to learn what they're talking about. Sometimes, yeah. But the point is, is that you can. Yeah. All right. How many, how many times, how many people have been working under? the false assumption, well, I heard that word once, therefore I should know it. So, 
You, no, you heard it once. You shouldn't know it. You may not even remember that you've heard it before. You can't assume. You can't assume. You can. We've all learned a lot of words. I know some words about my furnace. I have to learn the hard way. Every time I have, oh, every time I've had anybody there fixing it, I'm right down. You know, they think I'm there to make sure they're doing their work. I don't know. Uh, they, they think I'm there because um, I want to make sure that they're not wandering around the house and, you know, seeing something interesting to pick up. No, I'm asking questions. What do you call that part? What's this over here? Why are you doing that? It's the only way I'm going to learn because it matters to me at that particular moment. Thank you.